Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Great to see you. Thank you for coming out, and I want to thank all of you for making this possible for me yet again. You've been thanking me, that's ridiculous. Thank you guys for bringing all of us and this whole team down here to do what we really like. Uh, tonight, I'm gonna to be talking to you during Liars Club. Not gonna be telling the truth or lying, depending on how that works. Tomorrow, I'm gonna to give a lecture. Uh, the next day, I'll give a lecture on Ushuaia. But tonight, I actually want to talk to you about something that is pretty significant and important to us, and that is our experience down here in Antarctica and what we do now that we've been out of this experience that we're leading back and we're thinking about going home. And we've had a wonderful time down here. We've certainly got lots of education about the nature and the wonderful wildlife phenomenon. But I'm an anthropologist. You've been wondering what I've been doing down here this whole time, and I'm studying you. Uh, you are the people that come here, and I'm looking at human behavior. And so tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit on what Iggy had mentioned. And I hope you'll stick around for it. It'll be about five, 10 minutes, certainly, hopefully, worth it for you. Uh, I look at you, and I look at people, and I look at how people interact with the environment down here. And we're in a pristine environment that is used to not having a lot of people. And all of us have seen the negative effects of people coming down here and whaling, and what that has done to the habitat. And we've seen the way we remove ourselves from doing those highly aggressive activities that things start to come back, just as Sean Todd had mentioned earlier, very important. But the history of tourism, and tourism to Antarctica, is in constant debate about whether or not we should be doing it or should not be doing it. Just to give you an idea of numbers and the history before this beautiful quest came to Antarctica, you are now part of a wonderful tradition that actually goes back almost, in theory, almost 106 years old. 106 years ago, a little company called Thomas Cook decided that it was gonna launch the first ever commercial trip down to Antarctica. It was in 1910. They had a lot of good ideas, a lot of good marketing. It wasn't terribly expensive to come down here by today's money, but then it was. And then there was a little situation with an explorer that happened down here where he died, and that gave a lot of bad press to Antarctica. So Thomas Cook said, you know what? We're gonna hold off on that. It wasn't for another 30 or so years before people attempted to come back down here for commercial means, and that was using ships from the Falklands old delivery ships that would retrace routes and be what could possibly be our first official cruise tourism. Of course, Lindblad claims the actual first official sold to cruise down here sometime quite a bit later. But since then, things have changed. We can travel from all over the world to get to Antarctica in many different ways. You can fly over Antarctica, you can come by boat, you can cruise by, or you can do what we did, which is probably the best thing. Now, Antarctica is sold to just about anybody, and whether or not they actually make it to do an experience like us is a whole different story, and that gives us some cause for concern, because sometimes we get little articles like this, and if you buy into this magazine and don't see a naked lady or a polar bear down here, you might be a little disappointed. This is a... <laughs> Now, I'm an anthropologist, I'm from New Hampshire. This is something that we showed to third graders about Antarctic tourism, it's a little graph about how it's changed. So if we look at 1987, fewer than 100,000 people down here. 2007, that was actually the busiest year to date, over 40,000 people visited Antarctica that season. That's pretty incredible. We get most of these statistics through this company, this organization, IOTO, that we talked about. We really have to play by their rules, and they do some of the best research on tourism in Antarctica that is out there. And they're gonna tell us that over the, the course of time, from 2009 to 2010, we go to 36,000 people, we dip down to 26,000 in 2011, and then uh, back up to 36,000. If anyone wants to see this in more detail later, you can. Seaborne tourism with landings, that doesn't mean seaborne. You'll note the spelling difference. With landings, 24,000, no landings, about uh, just under 10,000. Air and cruise, air and land, such as going over, and then the statistics for overflights, no landing, are zero, because Qantas refused to provide the information to Iana. <laughs> that happens sometimes. So this year, we're gonna do a 4.6% increase in 2015 to 16. That becomes quite interesting. Otto's just released that in next year, the, the, and the, the season goes 2016, 2017, is what we're in right now. So through the new year and into that point when Brent comes down and gets locked in in March. And we're looking at the fact there's going to be 46,000 people, or sorry, 43,000, which is still less than that 46. That's a lot of people. So this is where your anthropologist starts to go to work. How many people is 46,000 people? 20,000 less than go to one single Patriots home game. 
go pats, or the exact number of people that can fit at Wrigley Field. Good job, Cubs. You see that? Happy for both those teams. But all of these people, which is a lot, 46,000 people seem like a lot, but not when you put them into a stadium, or when you put them right over here. This is where all of those folks go. And so I ought to just distributed this recently, which is even more helpful, that 75% of these tourists go to a space only one-sixth the side of Heathrow Airport. So actually, when we look at how big Antarctica is, it means that we're only treading in a very small area, which also has some repercussions. Because how we act, how we behave when we're here, certainly can affect it negatively, which is why we go to all of the trouble to do everything that we do here to help preserve this environment. Just as a breakdown, sort of, for where the people come from, because you're probably interested a little bit, the United States of America leads, then Australia, China, UK, Germany, Canada, pretty much like we have on board, an interesting sampling. Well, what happens when we see those people? What I noticed as an anthropologist was we all got a little possessive. We all saw these boats out there, this is from the other night, and we said, oh, what are they doing here? And I heard someone say, don't worry, hon, that's not as fancy as this trip, to which the wife responded, oh, good, and then walked away. I thought that was quite nice, and if you are that person right now, good, good job, I'm with you right there. But there's cause for debate. Nayato, which promotes this, says there actually isn't more than a minor impact on the environment down here through tourism. And that is exactly what a tourism outfit would say. I think that actually there are many positive benefits to all of us being out here because we become ambassadors for this great continent and we go home and tell the rest of the world about it. But there's a lot of debate with a lot of folks that have never been here about this. In fact, there are a number of people, I read this on Al Gore's internet today, there are a number of people that actually believe that every Antarctic landing has been faked. So, I don't know what the heck happened to, with us down here. Maybe that Uruguayan vibe is still going on. But so this debate back in 2003, is the rise in, in tourism helping or hurting? I think it's helping. But it has to have a limit on it. We go on to different debates. How can we have sustainable tourism to Antarctica? We can do it the way that we're doing here on Seaborn. If I didn't think Seaborn was doing a good job with this, I sure as heck wouldn't be here, and I wouldn't keep telling people to do so. This is probably the best way to do it. But then the debate comes, should tourists be banned from Antarctica? This was January of last year, of 2015, that this happened. So I did a little research last year. I interviewed 30 couples on each of the trips, and I found out that your average seaborne guest believes that the number of tourists to Antarctica should absolutely lower next year after they've been on board. <laughs> so yeah. go figure. What we have to do in this is keep in mind the importance of sustainability and the importance of having a very, very light, almost insignificant, <coughs> minuscule footprint when we're down here. What we do when we push you into the water and you wipe off your boots, we clean you when you come back on board, all the staff that goes over and says, don't walk here, walk here, that's because we have to protect this place. So all of you get a wonderful sticker, a little, a little a teddy bear, whatever you want for a sticker, for following these rules here. But the funny thing is, as soon as you leave here, you don't necessarily follow all those rules everywhere that you go. We did it for six days, seven days. That means we can do it when we visit Rome. That means we can look at our effect on our environments, not only natural, but also urban. And when we go back home, we scream as loud as we can about protecting this and other environments out there so that we can continue to see them learn from them, and those 100-year-old whales can say, wow, you guys are really doing a good job, not just here, but everywhere. There is a slightly negative effect to the tourism that's a silent uh, effect out here that we don't necessarily see when we're in Antarctica, and that's the effect on the communities after we've been here. It's great that all these ships come down and don't pollute, but eventually the stuff has to go somewhere else. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this and the huge number of visitors that go to Ushuaia each year and how that has an effect. So what can you do? When you go home, you can continue singing from the hills. You can organize your friends to come over. You can show them 
a few of your pictures from Antarctica. If you show them 9,423 pictures of penguins, these guys are going to want to obliterate this place just to spite you. But it's good. You can educate. If you want to do something cool, take a dozen of your photographs, blow them up, have them printed, and donate them to a library. Ask any of the expedition team for a reading list. Ask for ours and donate those books to libraries. Put them in places where people wouldn't think about this spot. And that's what you can do. You can have an art sale. You can do pretty much anything. We're all available for ideas for that. I'll tell you what, there was one in particular organization that probably made the biggest impact. In 2013, a group of 13 to 15 year old boys was incredibly inspired to preserve Antarctica forever. And that, I don't know how they managed to have that marketing campaign be so effective, but it worked. It even worked for some of us, you know, approaching 40. We said, let's keep this place good. But when you go home, talk about the penguins, talk about the seals, talk about the ice, talk about everything you know, without necessarily beating the ego drum, let people know about your experiences here, and that you are part of the preservation, but you can do that elsewhere too. We handled most of that for you, and it's up to you to wave that flag and to continue sailing around the world in a responsible manner. It doesn't mean that you can't relax and have a couple beers when you're out there, but certainly remember these lessons so that we don't end up just as one lonely penguin floating on an iceberg. Thank you very much. We'll see you tonight at Liars Club.